in this snow runner as of 73210 versus DAN 96320 heavy truck showdown. I see which is best and why. Cue the intro. There are two types of heavy truck in SnowRunner. Those that have barely any add-ons, such as the Colob Twins and Pacific P16, and then those that are as useful as something smaller, like the Tega King. That's where the Azov 73210 and DAN 96320 come in. These long boy trucks may look a bit special, bin lorry meets airport luggage truck crossed with ET basically, but neither has time to worry about aesthetics because they get stuff done. Which is better though? In the red corner, we have the DAN 96320. This six-wheeler cannot be raised, but it has 51-inch tires of the mud and chained variety, the advanced special gearbox, and a plethora of frame add-ons. Nice word, plethora. It can have a big crane, flatbed, van body, fuel tank, sideboard bed, saddle high, and saddle low, but no small crane. So maybe forget about dubstep wheelies and or missions that require you to crane things onto the back. You get just one spare wheel, not that you need it, because the DAN seems impervious to damage. In fact, in one mission across all of Russia, I took one damage about 10 meters from the end. Must have ET's alien powers or something. The Azov 73210, meanwhile, is one of the most versatile trucks in the game. Large maintenance trailer with more repair points? No problemo. Even the seismic vibrator fits, lol, making it the Swiss Army knife of SnowRunner trucks. But that's not the best part, oh no. It can have a flat bed or sideboard bed and spare wheels and crane and stall puller trailer. There aren't too many trucks that can do all of that and kick butt and take names off-road. Which brings me nicely onto the next category. Off-roading is a speciality for the 73210, thanks to 10 50-inch mud or chain tires, an advanced special gearbox, and the top-of-the-range engine that lets it talk the talk. Get it? Also, six of its 10-wheel steer, with the rear two improving its turning circle drastically. Bury the accelerator, and the Azov can go almost anywhere at its own ploddy pace. Like the 64131, one does not rush, although I will say that I find the 73210 more satisfying, because 10 wheels. Besides looking cool and improving the turning circle, those rear steering wheels actually help the 73210 and the trailer avoid scraping surfaces on paths where space is a premium. Its main weakness is a reluctance to get into fifth gear, which is a shame as once there it takes a particularly brown and sticky mess to slow it down. Much like the TUZ420, which has the same gearbox. I will say though that fifth gear can dig you into a hole, so watch out if you lose a lot of speed. Despite changes to the collision model, Mr. Azov still loses momentum if it touches the ground. This is not a truck for small hills, steep hills, or small steep hills although it's less of a problem now. Same with the Colobs and other nose-endowed trucks. Mr. DAN 96320, meanwhile, is slower in mud and snow, yet it never got stuck during testing, whereas Mr. Azov did. Yeah, fifth gear, I'm looking at you. It's not just traction either. Being further away from the ground helps it maintain momentum better on ups and downs, and it's more eager to get into fifth gear and cruise until you get to your destination or run out of fuel. Whichever comes first. Steering wise, the DAN is actually faster from left to right, but the lack of rear steering makes it more prone to understeer. As such, it will require a few more three point turns. Stability is an area where both trucks shine, but Mr. DAN is bouncier and has a higher center of gravity, so you will sometimes have to tame its excitement using the low gears. The Azov rocks so little you could probably stand a beer on the dashboard or a nice Earl Grey tea in a tribe called Cars Mug. When the big crane is in use, both trucks benefit from a low and wide stance. Plus the crane just looks right, unlike when attached to the Pacific P12. Feel free to check out my best crane trucks video. As for visibility, the DAN 96320 is one of the more limited trucks in first person mode. All that lovely metal that protects it from damage also impedes your view when looking left. It's not the end of the world, but worth noting, as the Azov is better in this regard. The short and sweet summary of performance is that the Azov is more assured and stable, but the DAN is faster and better in terms of pulling power. Considering both have AWD and diff lock always on, it's no wonder the performance gap is smaller 
than your annual snow runner fuel bill. Admittedly, neither truck offers oodles of customization, but I would recommend removing the rear fenders on the 73210 to avoid any potential tire knocking. And slap on the bumpers because they look cool. Just don't forget the flashing lights. At least, however, both trucks can fit a high up snorkel for moments when you want to see if your truck can be a submarine. And both are good on fuel and have a generous 350 litre capacity. So then, which is the best? Well, when I simply want to finish a mission and enjoy the ride, these two trucks are the ones that jump to mind, hence why I've put them together in a fight to the death. Ideally, I'd say buy both and sleep well at night. But what if you can only have one, which is the better choice? Well, in that case, the winner for me, and it's a close one, is the Azov 73210. It's more versatile, basically as capable off-road, has all the wheels and costs half the price of the DAN 96320. Hooray! Except the Azov requires a higher level and the DAN 96320, though more expensive to buy, is yours for free if you complete the relevant missions in Russia needed to rescue it. So in that sense, the DAN is actually better because you get it sooner and for relatively little effort. Plus, it takes much less damage. Sell it though, and you can upgrade Mr. 73210 and have a lot of change to pimp your Don 71. And that's the end of this SnowRunner vs video. Be sure to like, subscribe, join the Discord, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care, bye. Now, I recently did my best recent YouTube comments video, so feel free to go check that out. However, I thought I would do a little short Q&A at the end of this video. So here we go. Dream car. That's a tough one because I like so many different types of car. I think the dream car that I would like to have now, just that's sort of within the realms of affordability, would probably be the Jimny. I know I keep going on about it, but it's just a fun, cool little car. It's actually quite practical, as long as you don't have passengers. And I think it would just fit the channel really well. It could be quite fun. I'd put a roof tent on, probably raise it up, give it some bigger tires, that kind of stuff. So that would be, that would be pretty cool. But if money was no object, then perhaps, I don't know, something a little bit crazy, like a cool V8. Maybe a Shelby Cobra 427 SC would be nice. I do like Eleanor from Gone in 60 Seconds. So yeah, something a little quirky. I do also love supercars. I think the McLaren 570S is great. The 600 LT is great. The Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifoglio is probably the most balanced between sort of dream and kind of accessible because I think they've dropped to around 40k, which for what you get, I mean, it's it's a huge amount of car. But I'm a YouTuber, so that's that's not happening. <laughs> That brings me nicely on to the second question. Is YouTube a stable job and do you have a solid salary? Well, I do freelance for a few different places and that might be supplemented by doing some video stuff, car video stuff for a website. It's not 100%, but anyway, it will help fund the channel. But it's more about time than money because ultimately I would love to do so many different things, but there are only so many hours in the week and yeah, I have to do a little bit to keep the lights on and feed myself baked beans. But obviously as YouTube picks up and takes over and more of you watch ads and buy Tega King mugs, then yeah, obviously I have to do less freelance stuff and that's really, really cool. But yeah, is it a stable job? Not really, because I'm sort of at the mercy of how many hits and how many ads you guys watch and that kind of stuff and how much merch you buy, blah, blah, blah. But the main thing is the number is starting to go up. Number of subs is going up at a nice speed. So yeah, I think by the time I get to 100K, you know, touch wood, this will be stable enough. As a freelancer, I'm used to not having a constant paycheck and I'm used to months where there's nothing and I'm used to months that are really good. So I'm constantly living in fear and that, that's just become... <laughs> has become normal for me, so I don't mind it. It's not for everyone, but I like that freedom, but it comes at a price. Best game ever played. Uh, it's a good one. I think I have a lot of games I have fond memories of. Uh, it's especially games that I haven't been able to revisit because as they say, you shouldn't meet your hero because sometimes it can kind of ruin it. And I've watched old films like Garner 60 Seconds. I loved as a kid. As an adult, it's terrible. <laughs> it's so awkward. And I'm not even... Uh, 
<laughs> against Nicolas Cage. He's done some cool films, but that is just an awful film. Everything about it's terrible, except the chases and the cars. But uh, yeah, there was a game on PlayStation. It was sort of an RPG, but with a bit more of an action theme. It was called Vagrant Story. That was really cool. There was Final Fantasy VII. Absolutely loved great game. I remember trying to play it three, four times and I got to the same bit at the start and it was like, oh, this is so boring. And I think one day I just made myself continue and then, yeah, absolutely loved it. Great game. Not played the remastered one. Also, a lot of time for the original Gran Turismo 1 and 2. They were cool. That really, really sort of got me into proper racing games. Rally Sport uh, was one of the best rally games I've ever played. That was, I think, an original Xbox launch game. I was also a bit of a nerd and played EVE Online very briefly, but that game, it's a full-time job. It just takes over. It's too much. But I love the fact that it, it was so realistic. It had its own economy. I mean, they hired an economist to sort of govern the game because inflation existed and stuff. Like, it, it's crazy. Not many games have that sort of freedom. And there was the espionage with actual real-life people being spies. It's, it's a really interesting game, but it's very slow, so we'll never play that again, I don't think. And I accidentally answered this question, kind of. Favourite racing game? Well, just thinking about it, there was another really cool racing game on Xbox called Quantum Redshift, and it was sort of a, a wipeout wannabe, but the speeds were amazing, the tracks were amazing. It was just a genuinely exciting, fun game and I think the speeds were like 800 miles an hour or something. It was a bit like Pod Racer in Star Wars, so that was really cool. I'm actually really hoping the Xbox Series X allows you to play some of these older games because Kung Fu Hustle was another amazing game. There was a mech game where you, I forget the name, but you were in some sort of arena and you just basically had to blow robots up and last as long as you can. There was loads of customization and you could do sort of two, three hours in the arena and have serious amounts of cash uh, earned, but then die because you looked away for a second or went to make a tea. So it was an unforgiving game. But yeah, loads of customization. The weapons were cool. That was that was really, really good. I'll try and remember the name. But anyway, wow, we've just made the same much longer video. Hopefully you enjoyed these little Q&As. Maybe I'll just do best recent comments and Q&A at the end of videos. Or so. I don't know. But anyway, thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a splendid week. Take care. Bye.